All right, if you have your Bibles, our text is John 15. John 15. My kids, um, you're supposed to leave by now before I talk about you. Um, every year um, during Christmas time, they will give us a list of things that they want for Christmas. And, and there's this one thing that they always want, right? The prized um, gift that they could get. And so usually what we do is we make them wait for that last one. I mean, it's, they open, like one year it was a, um, fishbowl, and they're like, why do I want a fishbowl? And then they kept digging, and um, eventually they found the gift that they wanted. But there was, when they first opened their many gifts, there was like this expectation. They thought they were going to get something, and their expectations just fell, right? And they were just disappointed until finally the last gift, after we made them wait for a while, they finally got what they wanted. And expectations are a very powerful thing. We all have them. We all have expectations in life. We may not realize that we have expectations, but all of us do. We expect that life in general and certain aspects of life in particular will go a certain way. And if not, it's not that expectations in and of itself are bad. I think you would agree that oftentimes if it's major things when expectations fail you, they have devastating effects on your life. Unmet expectations lead to disappointment, and if it's a matter of a serious one, the disappointment can lead to despair. And so for this reason, it's important for us to foster realistic expectations, expectations that square with reality in the people that we have influence over. And in our text this morning, that's what Jesus is going to be doing with his disciples in the hours that are leading up to the crucifixion, the betrayal, crucifixion of Jesus. Here at Loft, we like to go through books of the Bible, and so we've been studying the Gospel of John over the course of the last several years, I think. I mean, we've been in this book for a while with the long break in between, but, um, but we have seen Jesus setting up his people, giving them expectations, telling them what he is about to do. In the last couple chapters, we see that Jesus encouraged their hearts with the word that he was leaving them for a good reason. In John 14, he said, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, that in my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. He encourages them. In John 14, the end of it, he comforts his disciples. He comforts them with the promise that, hey, I'm going to leave you, but the truth is you will never be alone. You will never be helpless. I'm going to ask the Father. John 14, verse 16 says, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another helper. And he is going to be with you. He's the spirit of truth, and he will not leave you as orphans, but he will be with you. Last week, we saw the first half of John 15, and it's a super encouraging passage of how God is more interested in our growth than we are, that God cares more about us growing and producing fruit than oftentimes we do. We saw that if we aren't producing fruit, that God would actually lift the vines so that the sun would be expo- that it would be exposed to the sun so that it would produce the fruit that God intends for our lives. We saw that even though we might go through pain and hardships, and sometimes we don't know why we go through pain and hardships, it's not in vain because God has a purpose to grow us even in those pains. We saw that God, the infinite creator of the universe, that Jesus, the savior of our souls, that he doesn't call us servants and he doesn't call us slaves, but He calls you and I friends. We are friends of God, and he calls us into community to encourage each other and ultimately to be on mission for him. I don't know about you, but the first half of John 15 is super encouraging. There are reminders in the passage that I need when I'm discouraged, distraught, and often feeling defeated. It's almost like Jesus pumps us up to live for him, and then we get to this next section. And to summarize what Jesus is about to say in the next section, it's, hey, I love you. You're my friends. I care about you deeply. And by the way, because you are loved by me, you're going to be hated. 
you're going to get rejected. The world is going to turn against you. If Jesus had ended his statements in the first half of John 15, then there are certain teachings in our culture, in churches today, that would make sense. That when you sign up to become a follower of Jesus, that you should re- expect to receive blessing after blessing from the Father, that life will go well, that you will have health and wealth and prosperity. All those things will go well for you. You'll hear statements such as, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And while that's an absolutely true statement, oftentimes those who teach those things have no answer to the problem of suffering and pain and hardship in the life of people. And so people will sign up for the blessings of God and the prosperity and the wealth that is ours because we follow Jesus, not realizing that even though there might be incredibly tangible blessings of pursuing Jesus, passages like today's remind us that there are trials and difficulties that also come with following Jesus. Jesus knew that in a few hours he's going to be leaving his disciples, that they're going to face incredible opposition from the world. Maybe because he just told them that they would do even greater works than he did. They, were, they were, might have been envisioning these crowds coming and smooth sailing ahead, but the reality was the disciples would face incredible persecution for their faith. Not just from the world out there, but even from religious leaders in Jerusalem. Let's be honest, for us in North America, especially here in the United States, the idea of being persecuted for our faith is hard for us to grasp, unless not being able to say Merry Christmas is persecution, if that's what persecution is. But um, now I'm getting political, sorry. Um, But if you and I were to go to the Galleria after service today, and we were to randomly stop someone, and we would say, hey, I just want to ask you one question. Yes, I look weird, but I'm going to ask you this random one question. We just want to know, do you hate Jesus? Do you hate Jesus? My bet would be that if we came back and we collected our answers together, the majority of the people that took a second to entertain our question would certainly say, of course we don't hate Jesus. Why would we hate Jesus? Jesus is okay. Jesus is cool. Jesus has some great teachings. If that's true, the statement of Jesus that we will be hated by the world seems to contradict the world that we're living in. Or the reality is there are parts of the world today where our brothers and sisters are losing their lives, not because of political affiliation or even the color of their skin or what ethnicity they are coming from, but they're dying simply because of a decision to follow Jesus and live their lives for him. And in fact, as much as we have progressed and as much as we've become more tolerant of people as a culture, the reality is the last several years, the last couple years has been the worst in terms of seeing followers of Jesus suffering for their faith. According to opendoorsusa.org, an organization that monitors the persecution of Christians around the world, it is estimated that every single month, listen, every single month, 255 Christians are killed for their faith. Every single month. Every single month, 104 Christians are abducted for their faith simply because they're followers of Jesus. Every single month, 180 Christian women are raped and assaulted simply because of their religious identity. 160 Christians are detained and arrested without trial imprisonment. 66 churches are attacked while services are happening in the middle of their services. These are just the stats of just the last several months. And in fact, as God continues to grow the church in parts of the world like Asia and um, Africa and China and India and the Middle East. Today, one in three Christians in the world live in an area where it's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. It's difficult. It's difficult for these folks. And while the idea that coming to faith means blessings and prosperity and health and wealth and a good life, the truth is there are many parts of the world Coming to faith means rejection, abuse, death. Let me give you a principle that I'd love for you to take as you assess things that you hear, whether those things that you hear here in our church or whether you hear them on Christian TV, 
And the principle is this. If your theology only works in North America, it's probably not God's theology. If your theology only works here in the U.S., it's probably not from God. If coming to faith means health and wealth and blessings here, but it means death and rejection in other parts of the world, we need to reassess our theology. So you see how Jesus is setting up expectations for his followers. He's preparing disciples to live in a world until he comes. And of course, he's not only preparing the 11 disciples that remained with him, but all of the faithful, including you and I. These are words of preparation, and here he prepares us by addressing our expectation. How will it go for us in the world as we live as followers of Jesus in this age between Christ's first coming and his second coming? What should you and I expect? If we expect wrong things, it will lead us to disappointment and despair. And so Christ equips us with proper expectations. Read with me the passage. We've already read it, but John 15, verses 18 on now, and it says, If the world hates you, understands that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would, have, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not have sinned. Now that they have seen and hated both me and my father, but this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me and he, um, because you have been with me from the beginning. This morning I want to set up the sermon a little bit differently this morning. Instead of giving you just several points from the text, I want to look at this passage and ask a few questions and then answer those questions. I want to ask three questions and give answers to those three questions. Number one, how is it going to go for followers of Jesus as we live in this world waiting for Jesus' return? How is it going to go for us as followers of Jesus as we live in this world waiting for Jesus' return? And the answer from our text is, as it was for Jesus, so it will be for us. As it was for Jesus, so it will be for us. How was it for Jesus in the world? Even though some people believed him, the mass majority of the people rejected him. To use the language of Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and one from whom men hid their faces. Faces he was despised, and we didn't esteem him at all. Look at verse 18 and see how Jesus prepares his disciples. He says, if the world hates you, understands that it hated you, hated me before it hated you. Verse 20 says, remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your word. Two things to be noticed concerning the way the world responds to Jesus. Number one, the world hated Jesus. The crucifixion was the ultimate expression of the hatred, but it wasn't the only expression of it. The whole life and ministry of Jesus was marked by conflict with the world. Even when he was born, Herod tried to kill him. Through his entire life, they tried to stone him, and and they rejected him. He was despised and rejected from the beginning till the very end. That is, by those who were not given to him by the Father. Jesus emphasized this with his disciples in order to prepare them for life in this world if they persecuted me. Expect to be persecuted also. He said, expect it. Don't let persecution and rejection take you by surprise. But notice also, there are some who did receive Jesus' word. There are few in number. They were the ones given to Jesus by the Father. When they heard 
the words of Jesus, they received it, they accepted it. And there's a promise here in this passage that the same thing will happen even after Jesus departs. Verse 20 begins by warning, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But it ends with an encouragement. If they kept my word, they will keep your word. I think all of this to mean that the same pattern will continue after Jesus' return to the Father. Christ was hated by the world when he was on the earth. The followers will be hated by the world as well. But some will believe in Jesus while they're on the earth. There will also be some who will believe upon the word of Jesus after he departs. And so we are to be optimistically pessimistic concerning the world. On one hand, we should expect to experience resistance and hostility and persecution and hatred. But on the other hand, we should expect victory. We should expect to see others know and love and serve Jesus. The gospel will go forth. The kingdom of God will advance. The word of Christ will not return void or empty, but it shall succeed in the things for which it was sent. Now, I'm sure there's some of you thinking, I don't know about all this negative talk about hostility of the world toward Christians. And you're like sitting there thinking, like, I have friends who are non-Christians. They don't hate me. They're not hostile toward me. In fact, they're actually nice people. We get along really well. Let me say two things concerning this. Number one, there's some confusion over the word world in this passage. If we demand that that word world means every single individual on the planet without exception, then we're saying that every individual person on this planet hated him and will hate you if you're a Christian. But it's better to recognize that that word world is consistently used, in fact, 78 times in John, to refer to the place that we live in the, um, in a general way. It carries with it moral implications. The world is in darkness. There's a prince of darkness, and it's in rebellion against God and the things of God. And so it's true. The world, the way of the world, is hostile toward God and the things of God. And as Christians, as long as we live in this place, we should expect a degree of hostility and hatred simply because we're followers of Jesus. But that's different from saying that every non-Christian hates and is hostile toward Christians. If that was the case, we should just be isolated and living together in a commune somewhere because the world hates us. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, go, make friends of the world. In Jeremiah, he says, hey, be a blessing to your city. I have put you in your city to bless the people around you. You should be grateful that God brings people into your lives, that you have friends that are not followers of Jesus. Jesus was, in a way, friends of sinners, wasn't he? He was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, Scripture says. And he invites us to do the same. With that said, we should also recognize there are different levels of hatred, different manifestations of hatred. Here I'm pointing to the reality in a sense that everyone not in Christ, everyone in whom the Spirit of God is not working, do to one degree or another hate Christ and hate the gospel. It may be that the revulsion to the gospel may reveal itself in a relatively mild way. Maybe it's grasping with the fact that you can't save yourself because you're independent, you want to do your own thing. And so they're revulsed by the idea that you're a sinner. And if the Spirit of God is not calling a sinner to repentance, there will be some degree of hatred towards the words of Christ. In other words, not all who are of the world will respond to the gospel in absolute hatred and say you should crucify and murder every Christian. But if the Spirit of God is not active in transforming their hearts, they will eventually push Jesus to the side. And what happens is Jesus says, you can't just push me to the side. All of us have to make a choice with Jesus. You either have to say yes to him or you say no to him. And when you say no to him, you're rejecting him. And so when you hear Jesus warn that the world will hate his disciples, do not take that to mean that every individual who is not in Christ will respond with all-out hatred and hostility towards you. That's not the point. The point is that when we ask the question, how will it go for followers of Jesus as we live in this world waiting for the return of Jesus? The answer is, as it was for Jesus, so it will be for you. 
as it goes through Jesus. There were some folks in Jesus' lives who were sinners that Jesus himself called sinners that were drawn to Jesus. There'll be people in your life that are not followers of Jesus that are drawn to you because the love of Jesus is overflowing from your life. There'll be others that realize of your faith, they'll be turned off by you. As it was for Jesus, so also it will be for you. Friends, persecution shouldn't take us by surprise. Hatred and opposition shouldn't catch us off guard. And even though the gospel would advance, and even though the kingdom of God will grow, the age between Christ's first coming and second coming, the gospel will go forward. But in that period, it will be marked by a degree of trial and tribulation for the people of God. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Second question, why does the world hate Christ and those who belong to him? Why does the world hate us? Why does the world hate Jesus? The answer is the world hates Jesus and those who belong to him because they're not of this world. Because they're not of this world. Look at me at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you're not of this world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. First, it's important for us to remember that Christ wasn't of this world. This has already been said in the Gospel of John, and we've studied this. Jesus spoke to a non-believing Jew in John 8, and he said, you're from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, but I'm not of this world. The origins of Jesus were heavenly. He came to us from the Father. He belonged to a different order of things. He didn't belong to the world, nor to the systems of the world or the ways of this world. He was different. Secondly, it's important for you and I to remember that if you and I belong to Jesus, we're also not of this world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You have been born again from above. This too we've seen in the Gospel of John. Those who believe in Christ, John 1 says, believe in him because they have been born of God. John speaks to Nicodemus, or Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, and he says, hey, um, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And throughout John, we encounter this truth, that Jesus has chosen some from the world to belong to him. The theme is here in John 15, verse 16, Jesus speaks to the disciples. He says, hey, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you that you would bear much fruit and your fruit would, that your fruit should abide. And again, notice in verse 19 that if you are of the world, the world will love you of your, as your own, but because you're not of the world, because I've chosen you out of the world, the world will hate you. The meaning is this, that those who believe upon Jesus believe upon him because God has graciously chosen us and called us. But notice we've been chosen out of the world. Two things are implied there. One, when we hear that those who belong to Christ were chosen and called out of the world, it reminds us that we are no different from other people if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus. We don't brag about we found Jesus. We rejoice in the fact that he found us. We don't boast about our morality and our righteousness and all the things we do for Jesus. We boast in all the things that he's done for us. Christians are not Christians because we're the cream of the crop, that Jesus chose us because we were the best people out there. No, no. Corinthians says that he chose the foolishness of the world to confound the wise of the world. Friends, he just called you and I foolish. And yet, he chose us by his pure grace and mercy. We were chosen. When we hear that those who belong to Christ were chosen and called out of the world, it reminds us that we no longer belong to the world. We don't march to the drum beat of the world, we march to the drum of a, the beats of a different drummer. Our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. We live for him, we pursue him. More than anything else, we seek his counsel, his advice. We want to do what he's calling us to do. To use Paul's language, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. See, this is why the world hates Jesus and those who belong to him. The world loves its own people. The world has a great fondness for those who think and live like they do. 
Peter comments on this phenomenon in 1 Peter. He says, with respect to this, they were surprised when you didn't join them in all their sins and all the things that they were doing. And so because you didn't join them, they malign you. They attack you. The world which lives in darkness is irritated by the light. And Jesus spoke to this issue when he was speaking to his non-believing brothers. He said, the world cannot hate you. Why would it hate you? But it hates me because I testify of that its works are evil. Think about the gospel which brings life to those who believe is also a condemnation for those who reject it. But in verses 21 to 25, that's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus said, but they will do all these things on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sins. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would have no sin. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But this happened so that the statement written in the law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. Listen, the passage isn't saying that if Jesus didn't come into the world, then all of us would have been absolutely guiltless. That's not what he's saying. That thought is absolutely contrary and absurd with the rest of scriptures. What he's saying here is that when Jesus came, he presented himself to the world, and the works that he performed and the words that he spoke forced people to make a decision about Jesus. And the sin that's in view here, the most serious of sins that we can commit, rejecting Jesus. In other words, when Christ came, the final word concerning God's love was spoken through Jesus. And he is telling you and I that we have to make a response. It's either a yes or a no concerning Jesus as a Savior. You see, the same thing happens today. When the gospel is proclaimed to someone for the first time, it doesn't all of a sudden turn them from being innocent into guilty because all of us were born guilty and full of sin. All of us have sinned. But it does bring the individual to a crossroads, of, sort of. Now, having been exposed to the good news of Jesus, you and I are called to respond. We have to choose yes, or we have to choose no. Now, an argument that I hear often is, hey, if you never told that person about Jesus, then they never would know, and they'd be okay. But that argument is not a really good argument. That if, because you told them, now they have to make a choice. And if they reject the message, you basically cause them to seal their faith. Suppose there's a man in India, a rice farmer, who lives with his wife and four children in a small village in Kerala, India. No internet, no, a, barely a black and white TV that works. Um, that's his whole life. From morning till night, year-round, he grows enough rice to take care of his family. He's Hindu, like his father and grandfather before him. And even though he's not particularly observant, Hinduism is the only religion that he's ever known. The only thing he knows about Jesus is that he is the God of the Christians. He knows nothing else about the Christian faith. One day, the farmer gets sick, and he goes to the local clinic. And when they can't help him, he goes to a hospital in a larger village. Eventually, he gets to a modern hospital in the capital of the state. And after running some tests, the doctor comes to the farmer and he says, listen, I've got some bad news for you. You've contracted an incurable cancer. There's no treatment available to you that can help you at all. And so he'd send him back to his village to die. And it happens that same week, one of these college kids on the first row at UTD discovers a cure for that exact same cancer that's, that this person is afflicted with. If, these, if this cure gets to him, the man will survive. If it doesn't get to him, the man will die. But the problem is the man has no idea about the cure that's been discovered, and these students have no idea about this man that's been suffering. Here's the all-important question. Why did that man die? Did he die because he had cancer, or did he die because he didn't have the cure? Think about it before you answer. 
the poor rice farmer died because he had cancer. Not because he didn't get the cure. Not getting the cure simply sealed his faith. He was dying before they discovered the cure, and he was dying after they discovered the cure. Either way, he was a dying man. He ends up dead because cancer took over his body. The cure that could have saved him simply didn't arrive in time. And in this case, it never arrived at all. Listen, friends, in the same way, all around us, there's people that are dying because they don't know Jesus. And Jesus says that you and I have been filled with the message of hope. That because Christ is in us, we have the hope of glory. The cure is Jesus. Some people are in their advanced stages that will live from, um, and others will live for many, many more years, but ultimately all of them are facing a terminal disease. The cancer of sin will kill each and every single person. But a cure for sin was discovered 2,000 years ago on the cross. It's called the blood of Jesus. It's so powerful that it cures the cancer of sin in all of its ugly forms, even today, 2,000 years later. This is why being on mission is so important. This is why praying for your neighbors is so important. This is why trusting that God is going to open doors of conversation so that you can point people to Jesus is so important because, friends, Scripture says if they don't know Jesus, they'll be separated from Jesus forever. And this is why Jesus has put you into their lives. Going back to our text, remember that the good news that brings life to those who believe is also condemnation to those who reject. Listen to how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians to Christians. He writes that you and I, we are the aroma of Christ. We're the aroma of Christ. When people come in contact with us, they should smell the sweet fragrance of Jesus. They shouldn't see hostile Christians who beat up people for everything that they do wrong. They should see a follower of Jesus that's so in love with Jesus that they just want that same Jesus. I've shared before how I came to Jesus, right? Um, grew up a pastor's kid, um, went to church all the time, but it was a high school girl that was in the same homeroom with me for four years. This girl just loved Jesus. I mean, it drove me nuts how much she loved Jesus. I mean, she just genuinely just was passionate about Jesus. And 11th grade, I said this prayer in homeroom. I said, God, you got to take this girl away from me because she's driving me nuts, or you got to give me the peace that she has. And it was that weekend that I encountered Jesus and dedicated my life to him. What does she have? The sweet aroma of Jesus. Did she ever tell me about Jesus? No. She just lived her life in such a way that you knew Jesus was working in her. How are you living your life? Is the aroma of Jesus overflowing from your life? Do neighbors and family and friends know you're different? Not because of what you preach at them. That's important. Please don't, say, please don't hear me say that's not important. But before you can have an opportunity to speak into their life, do they see Jesus overflowing from your life? Is the aroma of Jesus flowing out of you? Friends, it's no wonder the world hates Jesus and those who belong to him because you and I are not of this world. We don't belong to it. The kingdom of heaven is our true home. We have been raised with Jesus. We're seated with him in the heavenly places. We are just pilgrims on this earth. We have been born from above. We don't walk the same way. We think and speak and live in a way that is different from the world. We don't listen to the world for our opinions and our answers. We go to Jesus and we let him lead and we guide us. And if we were of the world, the world would love us. But because we're not of this world, to so the world to one degree or another is troubled by us. All right, last question. The third question that comes to mind, if all of this is true, how can you and I possibly stand in this world that will face hostility toward Jesus? The answer is that the Christian will stand with the help of the Spirit, with an ever-increasing love of the Father and the Christ whom he sent. Look at me at verse 26. This is where Jesus says that when the counselor comes, the one 
I will send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I wish I had more time to talk about these two verses, but notice this. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all mentioned in this passage. I think that's significant. It's a reminder that you and I have been united to the service of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. He, in all his power and glory, stands with us and in us who are his as we live in this world. You and I are not alone. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He is sent by the Son, proceeding from the Father in order to bear witness about Jesus. The point is this. We're not alone. We're not alone. Christ didn't leave you and I as orphans, hopeless and vulnerable. No, even though it's true that we live in a hostile environment, we serve the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who has richly supplied us with everything that we need and supports us in every way so that his purposes and his name will be glorified through our lives. Brothers and sisters, we are never alone. If you are a follower of Jesus everywhere you go, he's with you. When you face people that ridicule you or question you, he's with you. When you go through the dark nights of despair, wondering if this is worth pursuing, if he's worth pursuing, he's with you. You are never alone. So I got to ask this morning, because we come from all different backgrounds, as you pursue Jesus, what are you expecting in your pursuit of Jesus? Are you pursuing him because of the blessings that he promises? Or are you pursuing him because Jesus is your all in all? Because he is everything to you. Are you is your faith up and down based on what you experience and how you go through? Or are you so solid in your faith that you says, God, no matter what I go through, I know you're with me right there, so... I can trust you, and I can know that you're not going to let me go. Does your faith go high when everything goes right, and then all of a sudden you despair and reject Jesus when things go hard, or is your faith consistent no matter what you go through? I encourage you, he's with you. doesn't matter what you go through, what difficulties you face, he's with you. He's always with you. In fact, the passage in, in Hebrews, the writer says, God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And you've heard me say this before, but in the actual translation, it's I will never, 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 never leave you. You can't get more emphatic than that. It doesn't matter whether you feel it or don't feel it. He's with you. It doesn't matter if you had a great week or a bad week. He's with you. Why are you pursuing Jesus? Are you pursuing him for the things that he can give you? Are you pursuing him for all that he's already done? I can't remember who made the statement, but the statement is, When Jesus is all you have, you realize that Jesus is all you need. When Jesus is all you have, you realize that Jesus is all you need. Friends, if we can get to the point where we say, Jesus, you've already given me more than enough, that I'm not pursuing you for what else you can give me, Those are the added side benefits, but I'm pursuing you because you gave me your son. You loved me. You redeemed me. You called me your own. You called me your son, your friend. And so I pursue you with all my life. When we can get to that point, and we can go through whatever hardships, difficulties, trials we face, and we can know that he's with us. As we come to the table, it reminds us that the only reason Jesus could be with us is because he died for us. That because Jesus shed his blood for us, 
and redeemed us and washed us anew, called us his sons and his daughters. See, until that point, the promise that the Spirit could live with us is not realistic because we were sinners. And God could not abide in a sinful place. But because he has washed us and because he has died for us, the promise is that God himself can now reside in us. The cross makes that possible. And so as we come to the table this morning, we're reminded that the only reason we have fellowship with Jesus and we have a promise that the Holy Spirit will never leave us or forsake us is because Jesus took our place so that we could be part of the family of God. So can I invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. If there's anything in you that's not from Jesus, would you repent? If your pursuit of Jesus is not because of Jesus, but it's because of the things that Jesus gives you, could you repent? And then would you come to the table this morning knowing that he loves you more than you can dream or imagine? If you need prayer this morning, if you need just someone to pray with you, maybe you've gone through a rough week, maybe it's something connected to the sermon or something connected to your week. There are folks that are available in the back that would love to pray with you. Would you go visit with them, pray with them before you come for communion? Um, but let's spend some time with Jesus as the worship team sings. Let's just take communion together as a church body. Let's worship.